Hello and welcome to Animal Park. I'm Ben Fogel. And I'm Kate Humble and we're in Wallaby Wood, which is home to 24 adult wallabies. But if you look closely, you'll actually see that there are many more because some of the females have got joeys at the moment. Which are so sweet, I know, look they? at this little one poking out there. Well, we have plenty of stories coming up on today's programme, including... After 16 years as a threesome, two tigers face life-threatening operations... All three of the Tigers, really, are senior citizens. There's always that major worry in the back of your mind that something's going to go wrong. Big brown and beautiful, what else could they be but bongos? And how can a stag defend himself when his antlers fall off? The other stags have still got their antlers, their weapons. It's an extremely dangerous time for an adult master stag. But we're going to start with that worrying news from the Tiger House, where both of the females, Kadu and Shandy, are ill. Even in captivity, tigers rarely reach 20 years of age. So at 19, these are both old ladies, and each of them has had a major health scare in the last few months. Shandy, whose unusual white coat comes from a genetic mutation, survived an emergency operation in October for a potentially fatal mammary tumour. But now, keeper Bob Trollope has spotted a problem. The past few days, she's had swelling to the back legs. She's been on medication for that. The swelling hasn't gone down, so it doesn't look too good for her, I'm, I'm afraid to say. Kadu had to be given a general anaesthetic last year to treat an ingrowing claw that had become infected. But the routine operation became a nightmare when she reacted badly to the anaesthetic. She isn't sleeping, is she? Right, just keep doing that every five seconds, all right? OK, Brian. This way, just whip her right over. Kadu was hovering at death's door. How is she breathing? Well, she's coming lighter Spidey. all the time. Yeah. Uh, she's blinking and uh, she's a lot more responsive. Yeah. To everyone's relief, Kadu finally pulled through. But six months later, she's developed the same problem with ingrowing claws again. She'd kill anyone who tried to cut them without a general anaesthetic. But she nearly died under sedation last time. Despite the risks, keeper Bob Trollope knows that the vet has to be called in. She has started to limp a little bit more than normal, which is a good indication that something's wrong. You know, you could put it down to the weather and the fact that she's got arthritis. But the claw seems to be growing properly, but it's almost like she doesn't retract the claw. And uh, maybe that's something that we can look at while, we're, while she's uh, anaesthetised. But the anaesthetic itself remains the biggest worry. It was a bit of mixed emotions because, you know, you've got to sedate her and sort the claw out, but you know also that she doesn't do very well. So, you know, it's one of these days that you, you, you don't look forward to. She is getting on a bit, you know, she's going to be 20 this year, which is very, very old for a, a large cat. And so that's everything that's good, you've got to take into consideration. She's got to be quietly confident that she will pull through. But you also got to expect the worst. Vet Duncan Williams is all too aware of Kadu's problems with anaesthesia, but her ingrowing claws have to be treated before they get infected. In her situation, it's, she just doesn't seem to... She takes it badly. She does go much deeper than, than any of the others do, I think, probably age-related as well, of course. It's a big worry, really. Um, for that reason, I've got my colleague along, Zoe, and we, we, we've got all, you know, the... Um, gas and stuff like that. We've got some oxygen just in case she doesn't respond particularly well to the anaesthetic. And um, we're also going to try with a much reduced dose, which may be a mistake. It may be means she can't go under, she doesn't go under sufficiently, which means we're in sort of trouble again there. So we'll just have to see. We're going to check on Shandy as well. I mean, she's got this ongrowing problem with mammary growth, uh, which we removed last um, autumn. Um, she's now got a hind leg swollen, uh, which is probably down to the lymph glands, swelling up higher up the leg and it's just causing a sort of backflow problem. Um, but it's, if it's causing her discomfort and pain, you know, it, it could be quite serious, I think. 
Deputy Head Warden Ian Turner knows that the tiger's age makes the situation particularly dangerous. The, the main worries on all three of the tigers really are senior citizens. We've got a 20-year-old tiger and two 90-year-olds. What we could do when we had it before, we were really worried about sedation um, because the heart stopped and we had to keep, you know, right. keep a heart going all the time, so that's a major worry. But we'll clip the claw today. Um, hopefully everything will go fine and she'll have another few, three or four years. Um, there's nothing to say she can't do. Um, she might, you know, perk up, see the citizen and be fine. But there's always that major worry in the back of your mind that something's going to go wrong. There's an air of tension as the keepers prepare the anaesthetic dart and release sonar, their only male, out into the enclosure. Duncan, the vet, goes to check up on Shandy, the other ill tigress, while Brian Kent, who's in charge of the big cats, gets Kadoo's attention. Good girl. Sorry, darling. Yeah. We're a bit deceptive, then, aren't we? Do's. Could do. Give her ten minutes or so. It's um, nearly ten to. We all just go out, I think. Leaving Kadoo alone to reduce stress could improve her chances, but everyone knows that she may never come round again from the anaesthetic. In welcome contrast, there's some good news up at the giraffery, where head of section Andy Hayton has already seen three baby giraffes born this year. Now he thinks even more are on the way. We believe uh, Imogen is uh, due in August. Really? This year, along with Tweezer as well. So two of them? Two, and they're due within about four days of each other. Now, which one is Imogen? Imogen's right, right at the back. In Just fact, this is, this is Tweezer right at the oh, front Tweezer's, here. Tweezer's looking at us. Yeah, now. Tweezer's at the front here, and Imogen's right behind her, up against the back wall there with the enormous, uh, enormous stomach. Now, to my eyes, it's a little difficult to tell if their tummies are looking um, kind of extended, but obviously you spend every day. Can you tell that they're looking slightly more round? Yeah, Imogen's a pretty round giraffe anyway, so she's a bit bigger than you your average one, but they don't give a huge amount away until sort of like the latter end of the pregnancy. So this must be quite exciting news for you. Yeah, it's two first-time mums as well, so... Really? It's, yeah, it's... Hopefully they'll be OK. Does that mean that you have to take extra special care and attention in, in diet and looking after them? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we keep an eye on them. The, the best time of day to sort of see how they're doing is when we let them out, because you see them all walk properly for the first time when right. they actually go out in the morning. If there's any lameness or they're sort of slowing down or struggling or anything. Again, just watching them eat and things like that. If they've got a good appetite and they're moving around freely, then they're good. So will you be doing that today? We're going to let them out right now, so if you want to come down with us. Are we, are we able to do that? Yeah, that's fine. If you just stay with me, because okay. it can be a bit dodgy sometimes. They've got very powerful legs, don't they? Yeah, you don't really spoil your afternoon if you get kicked by a giraffe, so... Yeah, if you just stay behind me, we'll, okay. we'll be fine. OK? Great. Yep. OK, Cosy. So Cos is just going to open the door now, is he? Yep. And do you think they... Do they all have their, um, their kind of ritual of who goes out first, or will it... Will it yeah, is it just first come? It kind of depends on the weather. If they can see the sun shining, they all pile out. If it's a, a bit of a grey day like today... <laughs> Look at them all. Then they're, just, uh, they're just staring, going, down. you expect us to go out into that? <laughs> yeah. So I'll just go around and... Or Ryan's going to go around and push okay. them on out, and right. uh, we'll get them moving. Right, here we go. Once the whole tower have moved out, I'll be helping to get them down the hill into the big paddock. Back at the Tiger House, it's been ten minutes now since Kadu was darted and she's fully sedated for the operation on her ingrown claws. See that, Zoe? That's the one. She almost died last time she was given a general anaesthetic, so Safari Park vet Duncan Williams is performing the essential operation as fast as possible. Well, it's pretty nasty here where it, it has actually sort of just penetrated the pad a little bit. But, um, anaesthetic-wise, she's breathing really well, so that's excellent news. Yeah, see, that, that dose is a lot better for her, isn't it, eh? Normally, they get worn down just walking around, but because Kadoo's elderly and arthritic, there's little choice but to trim them. 
Well, long term, we could amputate Declor, Declora, but you know, you're going to declaw all, all of the nails. I think that's a bit excessive, and then it's going to stop some of the natural thing. It'd be quite a big job to do all of them. Well, it would be a massive job, and she's going to be in such pain afterwards. <laughs> So far, at least, Cadu's breathing well, and there's no sign yet of a dangerous reaction to the anaesthetic. The back one's all right, aren't they? She's obviously, she's obviously keeping them down herself. Should we ring around then, guys? Yeah. yeah. I'll cover over since it's a bit. Yeah, sure. Well, don't cover, don't cover too much over. We want to see, make sure she's still breathing. We won't be able to see that, but you know, if we heat it up down there. The operation has gone well, but Kadu is still in danger because until the anaesthetic wears off, she could stop breathing at any time. To make matters even worse, the team know they may be facing a very difficult decision about their white Bengal tigress, Shandy. Duncan cut a tumour out of her last year, but there are some worrying signs that the life-threatening cancer may have come back. To be as lame as that, like, it's, you know, as Zoe's pointing out, she probably wouldn't be as lame as that just from the lymph drainage thing. So it may, it may be an infection going on there, a cellulitis, but it's certainly uh, pretty extensive, isn't it? Well, apart from that, she's feeding. She's feeding, though. She's putting nothing herself, because yeah. she even come up and took chunks out of my hand um, yesterday, wasn't it? Mm. I mean, we let her out, but obviously, she doesn't go far. She can't move she's around too much, actually, no. It's pain she's in. A lot of pain in her legs and sore as that. Mm. To have to anaesthetise one elderly tigress is bad enough, but the keepers have no choice. Shandy will have to run the same risks as Kadu. That's gone off. Everyone is hoping against hope that the cancer hasn't returned. Good Good girl. Just waiting for her to, to go out now, which would be about ten minutes, I should imagine. Nobody knows what they'll find when Shandy slips under the anaesthetic. We'll be there when Duncan examines her. Over at the giraffery, the next job is to manoeuvre them all down into the paddock. So, Andy, this is... I, I can't remember ever getting this close to the giraffes, really. Yeah, the giraffes, we've managed to get them a bit sort of quieter mm -hmm. over the past couple of years. Um, they're, I wouldn't say trustworthy, that's maybe too strong a word for it. Right. Um, but they're getting better. Kohiri, move up. So this is Kohiri, this, this, this is, is, this bull, is the yeah. bull, isn't it? This is the only way, he's the only one that can sometimes be a little bit... So this is, the, bit funny. This is hopefully, um, he'll be a dad soon. Yeah, hopefully so. Um, he's proved to be an excellent breeding bull. Now, can I ask, you say that you've, um, it's, it's, you've kind of been training them over the last few years. Uh, how do you train a giraffe? Training's probably too strong a word for it. It's more um, getting them into a, 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 a really kind of strong routine mm -hmm. that they must go out in a kind of a, a, a nice kind of set fat fashion. But it's just being consistently every day, you know, making sure that they go out nicely and calmly and all the rest of it um, and it's 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 paying off you know they're they're, they're being pretty good now where i've lost imogen already imogen's there right oh, imogen's right here, here. yeah yep. so have you been having a, as she's been kind of wandering along have you been have you been keeping an yeah, eye yeah i mean they're not moving quite as well as they normally would in the mornings because they're sort of more interested in you guys than they are actually going out right but yeah you're just casting your eye over and anybody moving slower than normal i mean tweezers always slow she's yeah. just Bone idle, really. Yeah. <laughs> You've kind of got to push where, where her. Where is Tweezer? Tweezer's moving on, sort of in the middle of the group there. Right. But she's normally at the back, and she just plods along. Yeah. Jolly as well. If she thinks she can get away with not going out, she'll try and hide. You know. And so they really do out. have all their own unique characters. Oh don't yeah, absolutely. They? But they all seem remarkably calm today, the giraffes. Yeah, I, the... I really can't get over just how close <laughs> to, we are. In all my years here, I've never been this close to them. Yeah, it's it, we've we've just got them now to the point where. You know, they, they move down here in a nice, calm manner and they know that they're going out. Even with weather like this? <laughs> uh, yeah, like I say, they're slower on a, on a grey English morning than they are a nice sunny morning, so... But, they're, yeah, they're, they are good. 
Well, the giraffes are on their way into a rather muddy East Africa reserve. Andy, thank you very much for letting us get so close. And, of course, we'll keep you updated with the progress of Imogen and Tweezer throughout the series. The new area of the safari park is already home to three kinds of antelope. The elands are the largest of them, but there's a small herd of blackbuck as well as the six scimitar-horned oryx, which only survive now in captivity. Today, head of section Tim Yeo is bringing in three of the rarest, shyest breed of antelope in the world, the bongo. They come from the dense rainforests of central Africa, and they're so hard to see in the wild that zoologists only discovered the species within the last 50 years or so. I hope that they sort of come off uh, quietly, but you never quite know what's going to happen. All right. The three young bucks have come from another collection in the UK and are part of an international breeding program. Tim hopes they'll run straight into their new house without trying to escape. We really need to cut this gap out on this side. Could you take the box forward, but could you, um, could you pull him very gently downhill that way, just a slightly? As you... Animals like this, I mean, sometimes they'll go for gaps. You know, if they see a gap, they, we don't know. I mean, they may turn and try and run back through it. Absolute disaster if they get out into here because they're not familiar with the place. Um, it's new to them. They panic, they hurt themselves. The rather splendid name bongo simply comes from an African word meaning antelope. Tim's been wanting to bring some here for a long time. They're such beautiful looking antelope, they really are. Their markings are, um, to me, they're one of the most beautiful antelope that there are of the African species of antelope. And uh, they're a great challenge to, um, to have here and, and look after. So it's, it's been very exciting. In their native forests, bongos are most active at dawn and dusk, rarely venturing out in broad daylight. Their diet includes a wide range of leaves, roots and fruit, but they appear to be quite happy nibbling Wiltshire hay in the security of their horse box. They feel safe within this travelling box and they're not, you know, they don't always just come straight out. So I think there's some movement in there, I think they're um, when we initially dropped the tailgate, they were actually laying down, but I think there might be some movement. But it, it may be some time before they actually feel happy enough to, to leave this. And um, I think from our point of view, it may be, you know, if they, if they don't come out now, we, we would look at rigging this up so we can go off and leave them and allow them to come out in their, their, their own time. We'll try to get a better look at the bongos later on, if they can summon up the courage to come out. It's a very tense time in the Tiger House. Shandy is fully sedated now, so Duncan Williams, the safari park vet, can examine her safely. Duncan operated to remove a tumour from her a few months ago, and everyone's been hoping that that was the end of the cancer. Unfortunately, it's come back. It's massive. massive. What we found here is really bad, actually. The mammary growth is just... It's as big as it was before. It's ulcerated again. And that was just uh, October, so, you know, three or four months. It's, um, it's come back as big as it was before, so I think really it's bad news for her. The option of surgery is not on now because, you know, it you, feels you like it's almost feel going this is just now, huge here. Just yeah. It's exactly what the keepers didn't want to hear. It was pretty bleak then. Yeah. But you do surgery again, you're going to... You're not, we're not going to be able to take all this mass out here. We'd be able to sort... Well, I don't know, it's so deep now. Just got a big one in there. Mm. It's steeper in than it was before. It's much, you know, before it was more superficial, wasn't it? Yeah. I personally think the kind of thing would be to put a sleep there rather than bring her around and 
let her suffer for the next few days because she's suffering and she's not going to live out much longer now. Yeah, that's really sad. Yeah. Yeah, that would be very long, is it? No. No. October it wasn't. October it was. Yeah. Well, they are very aggressive in cats. Yeah, 90% are movement in cats. Which I suspect is probably right through into a lot of yeah. yeah. I'll go get an injection. It's a devastating blow for head of section Brian Kent, too. He's been looking after Shandy for more than 15 years now. It's the right decision to make, but obviously it's sad. He's, you know, looked after her so long. Um, she's a likeable tiger. You know, everyone loves her and she's going to be well missed, I'm afraid. Um, same thing, you know, working with animals. I try not to get too attached because something like this, but you can't help it in the end. You know, it's better this way. I mean, I don't like it, but I mean, you know, it's better for her. You probably have a few gasps of, uh, you know, reflex, reflex breaths. But I, I think fine, that's probably gone already. Oh, there's no pulse on her tongue anymore. Safari Park vet Duncan Williams yep. removed a cancerous tumour last year, but now he's had to put her to sleep. Very sad. I mean, it's very disappointing, but it's come back as quick as it, it has, really, because it's only about three months ago that we did a major surgery that we had to do on her on her mammary um, glands. But the cat mammary tumours are very aggressive, and we knew that this would come at some stage, maybe not quite as soon as it has come. You're going to miss her. She's a, she's a character. Um, you know, I've brought loads of people in over the years to look at the tigers, and the first thing that they do come through that door and go, wow, a white tiger. Unfortunately, they ain't going to be able to do that for a while. The big cat keepers have already experienced one tragedy today. If Kadu doesn't come round from her general anaesthetic, this could turn out to be a very dark day indeed for the tiger house. Throughout the rest of the safari park, of course, life goes on as normal, and nowhere more so than down in Pet's Corner, where head of section Darren Beasley always has something interesting to show me. I'm up at Pet's Corner in the Iguana House with head of section Darren Beasley, and, um, well, we've just been having a little stroke with Iggy here, and, Darren, she's looking dreadful. What have you been doing to her? She's <laughs> all flaky. Appalling. It's actually quite natural. Um, all animals, including human beings, yeah. will actually shed their skin, and the fresh skin comes through, and all she's doing is, is unlike a, a snake that would shed in one long big tube, for instance, yeah. uh, iguanas do it in lots of little bits, and we're just helping her just peel a little bit off here So is it? do you think it's a bit itchy? Yeah, it must be fairly, dis uh, you know, quite a discomfort, I would have thought. Yeah. But it's something that happens all year round. Um, maybe on the seasons, might get heavier at certain times of year. Oh, she's off now. <laughs> but what, what we do... Ooh. What we do is is they, they rub it off on the bark and, uh, and all the other, you know, bits of furniture and that in here. Yeah. Um, but, as you can see, the new stuff is underneath, so it just needs just teasing off here. You can do that. Don't know where. It's not going to hurt her? No, 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 no. No, it just tease it off just nice and gently. Oh, yeah, and you can see that lovely, fresh... Yeah. ..much brighter, cleaner skin it's underneath. Do you need to do anything special, sort of diet-wise, while this is going on? Because they're terribly susceptible to yeah. bad diet and things like that, aren't I, they? If you've got your diet right and your husband's you're right, the temperature right, you know, this will happen as of a course. Um, but it must be, mustn't be mistaken for uh, things like the funguses and other things they can get. If you're in doubt, whip them straight down the vet. Straight down the vet. The vet will tell you whether this was natural or not, but this is natural. Oh, good. Well, so she's she's going to be all right. She's and fine. if we carry on scratching her, maybe she'll be returned to her former glory. <laughs> Darren, thank you very much. And here is what's coming up on the rest of today's programme. Orphaned herself as a baby, will this young wallaby make a good mother? That's what I was a bit worried about, if she would know what to do. There are even tinier babies on the way, down in the butterfly house. What, those little white spots? Yeah. Those are butterfly eggs. Mm -hmm. 
and amongst the secret treasures of the great house, the letter that spelled death to a queen. So this document led to her execution, in yeah. theory. She'd already, been found, she'd already been found guilty. Back in the Tiger House, everyone's still coming to terms with the death of Shandy. Head of section Brian Kent is finding it hard to accept that she's gone. A bit numb, to be honest. Don't know how to put it in the words. Very hard. Um, I was talking yesterday, me and Bob. You know, this may happen. Um, we weren't really looking forward to the day. And, of course, you know, it had to be done. It was better for her. You know, she's obviously in a lot of pain. But, you know, as for myself, yeah, very upset. Um, you know, just got to try and get over it. The hardest thing would be tomorrow morning when we walk in here and she won't be here. You know, for the past God knows how many years we've been walking in, she's been up to her cage to say hello, and it's going to be one of these things that we're going to have to get used to, I'm afraid. But at last, there's some good news. To the relief of vet Duncan Williams, the other tigress, Kadu, has finally woken up. Just by reducing that uh, anaesthetic, we, which re reduced it quite markedly as well, it's made quite a difference. And uh, we kept her sort of from getting too deep, and uh, she's come around lovely, which is just like she used to do, um, you know, when she was a bit younger. This has been amazing. It's been a. a all sense and purpose is a success. Uh, you know, on previous occasions, she hasn't reacted very well to anaesthetics. This time, it's like a different tiger. But giving her a smaller dose, I think, is definitely the way to go in there. You know, she's, uh, she's all right. She's coming, coming around all right. Hopefully, within the next 24 hours, we'll be able to let her out and she'll be able to run around um, and do what she, she normally does. One thing is certain. The keepers will be giving Kadu the very best care possible as she recuperates. Last year, a very young Joey was rescued from her dead mother's pouch in Wallaby Wood and had to be raised by hand. Bev Allen from Pet's Corner took on the role of playing mother to the tiny orphan. It's just sort of got used to um, taking the bottle now, so as you can see, she's drinking quite well. It's just like a human baby, because um, you've got to get up, you've got to feed it. Um, if she gets um, too dirty, we've got to give her a quick wash and that um, to make sure she's clean. It does take a lot of time, but it's, it's worth it um, to see the um, young wallabies sort of grow and develop. It's, it's quite nice to see that. Over the next few months, baby Kimberly formed a strong emotional bond with Bev, who carried her everywhere in an improvised pouch and was effectively the little Joey's surrogate mother. I was, when, and she was very tiny. She was only four months when I was um, looking after her, but now she is fully grown. Yes, yeah, she is. And... Look at the little face. She's got a little Joey of her own now, so she's... You mum. didn't realise that means that you're, you've become a granny. <laughs> yeah, I'm grandma. <laughs> now, Bev Evans over here is feeding her. Hi, Bev. Are we OK coming a bit closer, do you think? So she's still quite, um, quite friendly, is she? Um, she is slightly. I mean, she's a bit more nervous. Now she's had the little Joey, yeah. she gets a little bit um, nervous, a lot of people around her. Um, she's, you know, she's happy with us staying at this distance. Um, you know, and she's got, she loves her bread, as you can see. She likes her treats. This must be so exciting for you to see um, a little Joey in her pouch like this. Look at her, she's, yeah, she's hopping off there. already. <laughs> but it must be very exciting for you, is it? Oh, it is. I, I've been coming up here quite often, um, annoying Bev, um, <laughs> keeping on to say, oh, have you seen a little Joey? Um, so I am really pleased. I mean, Bev let me know straight away yeah. when... And, and how long ago was um, did you discover the joey? Um, it was about a couple of weeks ago, in fact, because it's only just started poking its head in and out. It's, you know, it's got fur coming as well. So, um, yeah, it was quite exciting. And I have to ask, how, how does it get into the pouch? Um, it's, it's quite a difficult procedure, to be perfectly honest. It's, it's born, uh, and then it has to make its way up outside along the fur and then up into the pouch, which could take about three minutes. Right. And at that time, it's only a very small pink 
hairless little blind little joey and you know makes its way up a bit of a miracle really all the way up into the pouch um, to stay there for about nine months too. how amazing and then um, and then obviously it will pop out one day Willis yes. and, and join the rest of yes. the rest of the group do you think we can see if we can get any closer should we see if, go, if, um, yes. if we'll scare her away so um so obviously this is great news that uh, you know an orphaned wallaby has actually become a mum herself and she obviously has all the instincts does um, she yeah that's what i was a bit worried about if she would know what to do and i'm really pleased that she's actually mixed in with the group yeah um, she's not really that friendly compared to what she used to be as you can see yeah um, but that's good because we didn't want her to be really friendly towards the public. We want her to be able to mix in with the mob, um, and you know she's got a boyfriend called Mick. Um, <laughs> I was going to ask who. I was going to ask who um, who the dad was. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm really pleased. Um, she's she's got a lot bigger um, now, um, and the little Joey seems to be doing really well. She seems to be a really good mum, so she must have got that from me. Um, since I got up every two hours to feed her, um, but I mean it was hard work. But just look her how she is now here, it's all worth it. It's all worth all that hard work that I've done and, you know, back in with the group, it's, it's brilliant. And she's been well looked after by Bev and everybody up here <laughs> Thank now. Thank you, Bev. <laughs> brilliant. Well, Bev Allen, Bev Evans, Thank congratulations, you. I think, is the word. Thank you. And, of course, we'll keep you posted on Kimberly's progress and, of course, her Joey throughout the series. Not everything at Longleat has fur, claws or feathers. These are perhaps some of the prettiest and smallest residents and they have a new keeper who I'm going to meet for the first time. She's called Sophie Dunn. Well, I think this butterfly rather likes me. She's called Sophie Dunn. She's been here for just six weeks, I think, haven't you, Sophie? Yes, I have, yes. Look You've at this. blue morpher there. Isn't it beautiful? One so were you a bit of a um, butterfly fan before you started working yes, here? Yes, definitely. Very, always been interested in butterflies. Just always loved them and their colours and everything. What, what is it particularly about them that fascinates you? Well, from being from a design background, I think they're an inspiration really as is a lot of nature, you know, with the bright colours and the, the way that their cycle that they have and everything. So I find really intriguing. That, now, the, the cycle is extraordinary, mm. isn't it? Does that whole thing happen here in the butterfly does, house? Yes. Do you see the whole mm -hmm. process? Yeah, I have some examples. If you'd like to start with the eggs up here. We've got what, some those little white there. spots? Yeah. Those they're, are butterfly um, eggs. Mm -hmm. If you point notes down, those eggs of the um, owl butterfly. That is extraordinary that something as big mm. as a butterfly can come from a tiny... tiny it's like a pinhead. It is. It's tiny. I've got some caterpillars to show you if you'd like to come over so this way. So that's the next stage. That's they hatch the out stage, of the eggs. Which is here, if I point this towards you. This is the swallowtail caterpillar there. Right. Because you can see it's got this fork of the swallowtail there. And the caterpillars munch and munch and munch. Is that, that's yeah. basically their job, yeah. is it? Yeah, as soon as... If the butterfly um, will only lay eggs if it, on the leaves where the, it's the food supply for the babies, for the eggs to be born. So as soon as the caterpillars come out, they'll munch away because they have the food source there for it's them. It's right there. Gosh, that's clever. It is clever, yeah. providing for their babies. Yeah. And, uh, and then they go on to the pupa stage. Right. Which we have also here in the garden. This is the swallowtail pupa here, so on the, the top row. This, this one here? Mm -hmm, that can one I there? pick that up? Is that going to be you all can. right? If you just push it to the side to release the glue. Oh, okay. yeah. So that little caterpillar that we've just seen would turn mm -hmm. into a pupa like that. And it's got the fork again there, you can oh, see. Oh, yeah. And what about these ones? These just look like buds. These, this is the actual pupa of the one that you just had on your hand there. The, the that blue beautiful morpher. blue one. Mm -hmm. What? And this one is the uh, tree nymph, which is a beautiful white and black one, which I think these look like jewellery. They're so shiny and beautiful. Absolutely stunning. Now, um, I have to ask, why have you got them glued to a stick? Well, obviously, to, um, we had to collect them from the garden yeah. and um, put them onto a stick and put them into a safe environment for them to emerge. Right. Um, as we don't want them all in the garden on show as such, so we can hide them more and control the environment for them. So where, so where do they go? Show me. They the... go in the case. Shall we, okay. Do you want to carry that down? Okay. Yeah. Very Just carry careful. That light. Yeah. So it doesn't damage them to glue them then. No, no. They uh, they wiggle a bit as you glue them up, but that just shows that you know the temperature and things of your hands and things as you're putting them up. Right. But literally, as soon as they're in the case, um, they're fine. They just go, you know, straight into um, the same natural environment as they would have anyway. Oh, so. look at 
this one. That's the owl. That so we that's the one that, that laid those tiny those eggs tiny that we eggs, saw. Because this is its food plant, the uh, banana. So wow, it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, you must look after probably more animals than anyone else at Longleat. Yes, don't you? definitely. <laughs> Do you know how many you've got in here? Um, well, there are about 300 flying around yeah. at the moment. The species can differ really for all different types of species. There's probably about 20 different types of species in here at the moment, yeah. including all sorts of swallowtails or different types of them. So. Oh, lovely. Only a few really in the case. So. so they'll sit in here for roughly how long? Um, about two weeks. Yeah. Um, roughly, because we get them, we have them every two weeks, we put them in. Yeah. And um, the, this is the tree nymph I was talking about earlier. This one's just about to come out because it's, it's gone dark oh, there. You can and just the see the showing. wings. Yeah. Oh, that must be a fabulous moment, it isn't is. it? It is. I love coming every morning to the case and opening it up and they're all flying out. It's like the best part of the day, definitely. So oh, fantastic. Really enjoy that. Well, clearly you're the right person for the job because I can <laughs> see you. how enthusiastic you oh, are. Am, yeah. And um, would you mind just giving me a little tip-off next time anything's going to emerge? Because I'd yeah. love to see it. So, okay. thank you very, very much thank you. indeed. It's amazing. Up in the new area, the latest arrivals, three young male bongo antelopes, have finally left their trailer and are now settling into their house. For keeper Tim Yo, the bongos present a particular challenge. Their first instinct, as notoriously shy animals, is to hide away whenever possible. What we're going to do now is to, is to actually let them out into the yard. Um, so they can, they can come out into a small yard here that we've, we've, we've put a bit of a, a curtain around the yard just so that they feel a little bit more safe. Mark, can you, can you just, when they come out, when you see the first bongo, can you just talk to them or just make a noise, just let them know that you're there, please? Rarely active in daylight, bongos do not have very good eyesight, but they have exceptionally acute hearing so they rely heavily on that to warn them of any approaching danger. Unfortunately for bongos, leopards, hyenas and even human hunters like to eat them. Their numbers have also been cut dramatically in the wild by the loss of their natural habitat through deforestation, and they're now an endangered species. There are very few wild bongo. If you went to Africa and uh, to try and view these in the wild, I believe uh, you, you may go for a long, quite a, a period of time not seeing one, and you uh, indeed may never see one in the, in the wild. They're extremely shy and venturing out uh, probably uh, in the very early hours of the morning and, and the very late afternoon. Bongos are the largest forest antelope. These three are only 18 months old. When they're fully grown, they'll reach 1.3 metres at the shoulder, and their horns will be over twice as long, at about 65 centimetres. They're such pretty animals, I keep saying it. They've come out on the yard here, and uh, they're so chilled out about it all, and um, it really is uh, the best we could have wished for, really. Now that the bongos are at home in the yard, Tim's next challenge will be to persuade them to go out into the wood and hope they don't hide so well that we never see them again. Tim Yo is a very busy man. As well as all the antelopes, he also looks after a wide assortment of other animals, including white rhinos, Ancoli cattle, water buffalo and Bactrian camels, not to mention three herds of deer. Most of the time they graze placidly, but right now the deer park looks like a battlefield. Is this a result of a fight? What's been going on? Kate, it's not. It's uh, it's literally it's the time of year when uh, I'll just negotiate this Ooh, well done. ditch here. Yeah. It's the time of year when the the stags uh, annually cast what we call cast the, the antlers drop off. So just they literally off. just fall off. That's right. Yes. But that it. seems insane because I right. just thought. I mean, it's spring now. I just thought yeah. this would be the time where you'd want the biggest, most magnificent antlers you can possibly have and do a lot of serious flirting. But you're saying that happens later. 
I mean, different species, there are many different species of deer, and some are uh, getting ready for their breeding season right. at this time of year. But some, uh, like these, the, the red deer and the fallow deer yeah. that we have in the park, their breeding time is, uh, the peak of it is in the autumn. Right. So theirs is over. So they're shedding the, I mean, do, don't they need them for, I don't know, scratching themselves? Or, I mean, what, what do they use antlers for? Right, well, they, they certainly do come in handy for that sort of thing, for, yeah. for, for, a, for an irritating scratch or itch. But, but uh, predominantly, they, these are, 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 are fighting tools, I mean, they're weapons, predominantly. I mean, a stag is looking to, in the breeding season, to collect as many hinds, which are the female deer. Yeah. And he, he needs to defend, uh, you know, and keep those hinds. Right, and he so needs he to be needs able to, to fight, to fight off. off. Males. Exactly. And, and is it true to say that the, the kind of bigger the antler, the, the more dominant the stag? Or, or is that not necessarily true? I think it's fair to say in many cases that that, that is, is how things work. Um, but uh, as with humans, uh, you get some deer that are much more aggressive than, right. than others. And they will... You know, they, they will really fight hard to, to and, and, and possibly just, it's, it's a confidence thing as well. You know, if they're extremely confident about yeah. it themselves and, and aggressive to fight, then they'll put off these animals that may have, they may have larger antlers. And presumably this is, this is quite a sort of dangerous time of year for stags if they haven't got antlers. The shedding or casting starts with the older animals. And so this could be a time of year when the dominance actually changes, when a younger stag who still has his antlers could actually take advantage. Exactly. It's an extremely dangerous time for, for an adult dominant you know, master stag because he, his, his antlers drop off. He immediately has to seek... Uh, you know, a quiet corner somewhere, you know, hundreds of wow. metres away from the others, just keeping his head down because it's a very dangerous time for him. It's absolutely fascinating, Tim. Thank you very, very much. I, I'm, I'm just really looking forward to coming back. About uh, August, you say, is when they're back in full antler again. That's right, Kate. That's well, it. we'll look forward to that, Tim. Thank you very much. It's absolutely fascinating. They are beautiful animals. <laughs> The great house at Longleat has stood here for over 450 years. Fourteen generations of the Thin family have filled it with superb paintings and other works of art. But it also houses some priceless historical documents. I'm up in the climate-controlled strong room at Longleat House with house curator Kate Harris, and we're lucky enough to get a sneak preview of some rather important documents before they go off on loan. So, Kate. What do we have here and where is it going? We've got our most famous piece of paper. It's the Titus Andronicus drawing, uh, which is the only surviving contemporary drawing of a Shakespeare play. Titus Andronicus is Shakespeare's first tragedy. It was right. performed first in 1594. And the drawing is by a man called Henry Peacham. What we've got here is um, Tamara, the Queen of the Goths, with her two sons, right. and Titus Andronicus himself and Aaron on the moor, and there's a quotation from the play where Tamara is pleading for the lives of her sons. Titus has just been victorious in battle and has brought them back in triumph. And this dates from that period, does yes, it? Yes, it does indeed. From 1595. There, the, its endorsement is 1595, and the date given by P.G. himself is 1594, which is actually exactly the date when the and play is, was first performed. This is the only existing. Yeah. Drawing, is it? It's the only existing drawing of a Shakespeare play. You'll see that there's a, a mixture in the costume where they look both Elizabethan with allusions to Roman togas and Roman armour. And where, where is it, it going? It, th this is going to the um, National Portrait Gallery. There's a very important um, exhibition going to go be put on for their 150th um, anniversary celebration. Um, and it's called Searching for Shakespeare, and they'll be showing their Chandos portrait of Shakespeare, which is one of their earliest acquisitions. But they're collecting together a whole sequence of other related materials, so they'll have first folios and they'll have the Titus Andronicus drawing. It's going to be shown with the published wow. um, 1623 first folio. So this actually originally comes yes, from originally this... Yes, originally it's part of this collection. It's been removed from the first volume of our Portland papers, which is very broadly speaking equivalent to a modern autograph collection. Okay. It's formed... literally full of signatures. Well, letters, complete letters. It was formed in the very early 18th century by the first and second earls of Oxford, that's um, Edward and Robert Harley. 
Um, and it includes letters from Henry VIII. Really? Uh, material from Elizabeth I, letters from Walter Raleigh. Here, original do original yes, letters in, yes. their, in their own hand? Yes. And we've got here an attested copy of the confession of Queen Catherine Howard just before she's executed for adultery. So that was Henry VIII, was it? Yes, one of his wives, yes. Um, and it's signed by the members of the Privy Council to attest its authenticity as a confession. Oh, so this document led to her execution, in yes. theory. She'd already, been found, she'd already been found guilty. Oh, here we've got um, a warrant from Elizabeth I banning hunting. <laughs> banning hunting? Banning hunting in her park at Eltham, but not banning it for very long. She just wanted to ban it for two years so that the hunting would actually be better next time. It <laughs> really is a rather yes. selfish act, perhaps. Uh, and this yes. is her signature, is it? Yes, this isn't her hand, but it's signed by her. It's sealed here as well. Absolutely amazing. Kate, thank you so much. You're welcome. I think we could um, spend hours going through all of these. <laughs> I think of all reptiles, these are the most spectacular. Of course, I'm not talking about Darren Beasley, head of section, <laughs> section in Pets Corner, but this amazing chameleon. He is, is magnificent, Darren. Will you go onto my arm, do you think? Oh, oh yeah. Look at that. He's got fairly sharp claws, but he's... Okay, I've got a big, thick okay. coat on, so he'll be all right. Now, tell me a little bit about him, because he is just spectacular. Yeah. He looks like he's been sort of spray-painted. Um, we call them uh, Yemeni chameleons, right. region they come from in... in they come in, so, from the Yemen, do yeah. they? Um, and like all chameleons, they're, they have these beautiful, beautiful markings, this coloration here. And when they're very excited, when they're hungry or they're displaying, yeah. they, they, they get these vivid bars and greens of yellow and, and browns. And, of course, people always say they blend to their background, which yeah. they do to a certain degree, obviously, because there's lots of different shades of green. But um, if you popped him in a purple box, he probably wouldn't go purple. He wouldn't go know, purple, no. so that's a bit of a fallacy. Yeah, and do, do you know what... Ooh, you're <laughs> no, quite speedy, aren't you? Chameleon stick here. Do you, do you know yeah. what it is that actually makes that colour change? Is it is it something in the skin? Is it the blood? Yeah, is it... It's, it's, it is the blood in the skin, yeah. Um, and it's just the pigments. And it's if, if you see him under different lights, yeah. um, he actually does come... He looks the blues and the, and the purples, yeah. but in fact, really, that's just the reflections. It's just the reflections right of the light. And what about this extraordinary crest on the top of his I head? Know. Isn't that amazing? It's... It's for there for several reasons. We think it's there mainly for display. Right. Um, but also, we've been uh, obviously doing our own little bit of research on this. Yeah. Uh, and, and from what we see and what people tell us, they've got this very strange vision. See these little coned eyes here? Yes, they're extraordinary. They can move in every single direction yeah. by the looks of things. They can't actually see still water. So to drink, they shoot their, their tongue out and they get drops of, of dew and stuff on, right. on, on, on the leaves. But also, this crest here acts as like a rain funnel almost. The rain hits it and it actually comes down and runs into the corner of their mouth. So it's a rain That's catcher, which is absolutely wonderful. I just... Absolutely brilliant. And just getting this amazingly close-up view of him, um, one thing that you, is very typical of chameleons are these very strange sort of two-pronged yeah. feet Isn't that they sure? have. So he's got mittens on, it's doesn't he? <laughs> absolutely. I mean, again, is that an adaptation because they're good climbers? They are fantastic climbers. I mean, we've seen this guy here literally stand on one leg suspended in mid-air just by one, one foot. Uh, and he's got such a strong grip, these, these mitten-like feet. They've got tiny little claws as well, these mitten-like yeah. feet. He's not going to let go. And also they have, if I turn him around, he's got the, the prehensile tail. Just like it's, a monkey. Just like a monkey. And, and he uses that. There we are, let's get him on. He's, he's more comfortable in there. And he actually will hang on, and that's, again, to help him to hold on if he's climbing a tree. Excellent climbers. There you are, that's a... A fifth leg, if you like, or a fifth it's hand. Extraordinary, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Should we put him back in? Because I feel yes. like he's getting a little bit restless. And he also has a very handsome friend in here. Yeah, this um, is... The one you've got is... Let's get on his stick and I'll climb up. The one you've got is called Ozzy. Yes. There it goes. The one up there in full colour is called Claude. Right. Um, and normally, these can be quite aggressive to each other, these male chameleons. Yeah. Um, so what we tend to do is, usually as a species, you keep them on their own. But we've done a bit of an experiment here yeah. to see if we can keep them together. And they get on really well. There's no fighting, no problems. And let's put them on there, and away he goes. So would they normally be quite territorial? Oh. They'd say, oh, we've got my area, and, and that's what I want to stick with. Very much indeed, yeah. And they will fight, they'll fight over area, they'll fight over uh, females. 
Um, and, and we haven't had that problem. There's no females in there and plenty of space to keep it out of the way. Lots of space, lots of heat, presumably important heat, for them. Lots of ultraviolet light as well, just like most of the other reptiles. And lots of bugs, lots of, you know, <laughs> Lots, Lots of, of wiggly horror, things. Wiggly, for them wiggly to eat. things from doing. Well, um, I was going to say it's been fantastic to see them. Not them, but <laughs> uh, but but him. He's absolutely magnificent, Darren. Thank you very very much Thank indeed. You. Thank you. A day has passed now since the sad death of Shandy, the white Bengal tigress who had to be put to sleep after developing cancer. In welcome contrast, Kadu survived a general anaesthetic to treat her ingrown claws. And keepers Brian Kent and Bob Trollope are keen to see how she is after a good night's sleep. She's looking very well, you know. Back to normal as such. Um, as you can see, she's up for a, a fuss. She must probably come over for a cuddle in a minute. Yeah, but, you know, just walking around there, that's, that's ideal. It was hard. First thing this morning, opening the door, we both said the same thing, looking in and thinking, you know, where has she gone? You know, it's an open big space. And it's very, you know, still very hard to adjust to it. I think it's going to take time. Um, but, you know, see how it goes day to day, really. Kadu may be wary of the keepers after being darted yesterday, so Bob's giving her a snack. Well, this is uh, just a little treat I'm going to try her with, just to see if she's uh, going to come up to us. Just got to get that truss back into us. Because we've um, obviously darted her, she does uh, remember little things like that, so it's just a bit of a tip bit to see if she's going to come up. Come on, dudes. What's some of this? Come on, darling. Oh, come on. <laughs> Good girl. Come on, then. Come on. I'll give it a sonar. Let's see sonar. Come on then, mate. Do you want some of that? Good boy. Good boy. Good, yeah. We're going to see if your girlfriend wants some, shall we? Good day. Come on, darling. Good girl, see? Good girl. Yeah. Good girl. You want some? Oh, you like that, don't you? Hey? Like that. As she's uh, feeding now, that's a good thing. She's starting to feel a bit more confident coming back towards us. So, you know, she like should be all right now. That's all it is, is to build up her trust again. Um, obviously, we don't like inflicting pain on the animals, and, you know, darting them does give them a little bit of pain for a short amount of time. And just for her to get our trust back again, yeah, eh? You know, it's, it does us all right. And you benefit as well, don't you? You get little tidbits. Since Kadu seems to be as right as rain, they've decided to let her out with sonar. She's looking surprisingly good, you know. You'd expect a, a slight limp anyway, because she's arthritic, but um, she looks fine. In the wild, tigers are solitary creatures, but Shandy, Sonar and Kadu lived here together for 16 years. Now as they keep looking back, looking for Shandy, I suppose. They're anticipating her to come out, but unfortunately that's not going to happen. For tigers and keepers alike, the passing of the stunning white tigress is going to leave a big gap. Shandy, as a, as a tiger, was quite an individual. She, from the moment we first had her, she was always different than the other tigers, not just to the fact that she was white. Her behaviour... Um, I always jokingly said that she was our blue-eyed blonde, because she's a little bit dopey at times. But, you know, she was a, a smashing animal. Every so often you do get ones that come along that you... you know, you get attached to, like Bob said, you know nice character to him. You don't get that a lot. You don't get that many chances with it. And when you do, you've got to make the most of it. And hard, really. Yeah, the routine has changed totally altogether. You know, we come in here, um, just preparing the medicine for her or, you know, 
going along the line with the chunks of meat, you know, there's, there's a tiger missing. It's one of those things that as soon as you, were, you come into this section, you were drawn to it because obviously you've been a white tiger. You expect to see tigers, but you expect to see tigers like Kadu. And all of a sudden, this big white thing looms over. You know, it is a sight to be seen. And the other thing with Shan is that I'm waiting for the last car at night. She used to get so fed up, have you ever noticed her? Yeah. She'd be wandering around the house, basically look like stamping her feet in a way. Sounds stupid. And she used to look at that car, wander around up by it like, oh, you see me, no go. <laughs> and then she'd wander back to the house, you know, wanting to go in. By the end of the day, she had a, as I can see, a lovely life. You know, a lovely space to go out into, no hassles, is she? Right. Um, so I think she had a great life. Well, it's the end of another busy day here at Longleat, and Kate and I are here on the back of a pickup, helping round up some of the animals. Yep, the giraffes, it's their turn to go into their house for the night, and it's an incredible feeling, actually, isn't it? Driving very slowly behind a sort of, really like a giraffe traffic jam. It's extraordinary, <laughs> and I like the way that Tweezer is um, bringing up the rear there, yep. very slow, ambling very, in. Very slowly, very majestically, just making sure all the rest of the females <laughs> are going in the right direction. Well, that's all we've got time for today, but here's what's coming up on the next Animal Park. Why the head of Pets Corner is taking a crash course in lion keeping. I put my foot down at lending a hand to feed ostriches. Give a little bit of uh, cabbage in there. <laughs> I'm not sure I dare do that. <laughs> and I get a feel for life on the farm with the Safari Park vet. Would you like to have a go or? Um, I've, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say can I. <laughs> <laughs> 